Swinburne University of Technology. Welcome to the family lecture. This is lecture eight and we're going to talk about families. What, what, what have I called it? I've called it oh, the sociology of marriage and family. Um, like, um, like the education uh, lecture I, I gave last week, um, we we look at the context of, of we look at in, in sociology, we try and broaden the context to understand all of the dynamics that, that feed into to these p particular areas in order to, to understand them. Um, and as I was talking about in the last lecture, um, we've just had, well, seven, eight weeks ago now, um, the, um, the meeting of the Prime Minister and, and three gay couples over dinner at the Lodge to talk about gay marriage and gay marriage is probably an interesting place to start and then we'll sort of wind back and look at look at um, how the family and marriage developed over time. Um, the gay marriage issue um, I suppose to a certain extent popped up out of nowhere um, and if, if you think about the the functionalist view, the Durkheim view that I've talked about uh, over the course of the last few few weeks, eight weeks, um, uh, where you're looking at social formations that affirm the status quo, and in the socialisation lecture, I was I was talking about Talcott Parsons and how Talcott Parsons saw socialisation of children, particularly in the primary form, the, that's the early stages, the first stages of socialisation, the, the affirmation of the role of family as a heterosexual union, uh, so yeah, that is a man and a woman come together in marriage to produce children work and contribute to society. And so heterosexuality um, in this, this functionalist Durkheimian sense is really quite important. Um, so the functionalist, the functionalist attitude towards marriage is that marriage is an institution that, that will affirm the, the surrounding values, norms and ethics of, of the society. Um, you can see with the issue of, of, of gay marriage how this functionalist view has stretched a bit because the argument is that, that uh, the majority of the Australian population, um, based on, on survey research, so it's you know, the statistically sound, um, the majority of the Australian population is in support of gay marriage. Um, so values, norms, ethics have, have stretched or moved on to embrace this uh, this form of, of, of marriage, this form of, of coupling um, and it's become part of then what you think of as, as what you could start to think of as, as part of the functionalist view of society, that is the surrounding norms and values have embraced the notion that, that uh, a same-sex couple should be able to get married and in fact should be able to, to raise children, whether they're, they're children of their own or they're, they're adopted. Um, so the functionalist view does 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 mould and bend um, to to changes, but it does it takes a long time, and we can we those of you who are as old as me um, will have seen that progression over the last forty years or so. Um, nonetheless, um, there's been resistance to to marriage, to gay marriage, um, particularly by the prime minister. So we've we've um, uh, we've had a, uh, the Labor Party meet and say, yeah, it's okay, we're, we're happy with gay marriage as a part of, of our core values and it becomes a part of their platform. But then the Prime Minister says, okay, well, yeah, we can well accept that, that the Labor Party are embracing gay marriage, it's a part of our platform, but I'm opposed to it. So that's a, a, a very influential voice. The Prime Minister then gave a, a, uh, the right for a conscience vote. That means the, the members of the Labor Party who are normally compelled at pain of being sacked from the party 
uh, to vote with whatever the government position or the Labor Party position is are freed up from that commitment and are allowed to vote on their conscience. Uh, yet uh, the influence of, of the Prime Minister's point of view is going to dissuade certain of those who aren't uh, willing to, who may be willing to vote for it but who aren't willing not to support the Prime Minister uh, because that would also be seen as a vote of no confidence in, or a vote of lack of confidence in the Prime Minister. Uh, so there's, there's a political dynamic that, that underlies this, that, that you, have to, you have to understand. So one of the reasons gay marriage, oh, well, let's see, I'm, the problem is now I'm, I'm doing these lectures at the beginning of the semester. They may have the vote, they may have had the vote. What am I going to do, David? He doesn't know, neither do I. They may have had the vote by the time I'm giving this lecture. I'm assuming, let's assume, that the vote's not going to go through because the Liberal Party aren't going to give um, their people the right for a conscience vote, although it is acceptable for Liberal Party members not to vote with the party, but there's always a strong persuasive element if the leader of the opposition in this case um, is voting a particular way and asks that the, all the members vote a particular way. Chances are it's not going to go through. So um, this sort of, this aspect of marriage, intimate relationships and coupling is highly political and highly politicised. Now if we, we sort of move back through the history of that, part of the argument um, that the anti-gay marriage people have, have offered um, in defence of denying gay people the right to marry is that marriage has always been an institution between a man and a woman and it goes back to time immemorial and uh, the religious people will, will argue that, that it's a right um, uh, given by God and sanctioned by God um, and so that, that sanction uh, given that the church um, the traditional church anyway, and uh, the traditional Christian church I should say, and, and the others um, aren't particularly keen on homosexuality. The more progressive churches within say the Uniting Church Forum, and not all of those, but, but some of those are, don't have a problem with it. Some of those in the, the Church of England don't have a problem with it either. Nonetheless, um, there has been the, the historical argument put this has always been the case. Well, I'm afraid it hasn't always been the case. Um, marriage is, has, yes, been, been between men and women, um, but it's not been sanctioned by God, and really marriage was actually sanctioned by money and capitalism and, and, and property. Um, marriage really became, um, became uh, an enforceable right, if you like, um, um, only relatively recently, um, uh, obviously uh, through um, um, history in terms of the, the relationships that were formed between uh, royal families were, were strategic. I mean, a, a cursory look at, look at English history, you, you see the, the marriage that went on between um, kings and, 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 and uh, queen, kings and queens and their, their various consorts were, were always strategic and always about um, making relationships with other, with other powers. I mean maybe Albert and Victoria was one of the first romantic relationships um, and that was probably more luck than, than good management. Um, so marriage in that context has always been a strategic, not a romantic Thing and not necessarily, well, about producing children, but, but, but more's the point. Um, uh, producing children strategically, that is to produce an heir and go back to Henry VIII and look at all the problems that he had producing an heir of the right sex. Um, um, the, the rest of the population in, in history wasn't all that concerned about marriage and marriage wasn't, wasn't uh, a particularly important institution and it was only when property became um, uh, 
access to property, that is money and, and relative wealth, that marriage became important. And then marriage was, was about then producing dowries, again, on a, on a, on a sort of scaled down level, the, the sort of strategic alliances between, uh, between wealthy families and others. And so monies were exchanged, dowries were exchanged, goods were exchanged. Um, and it was, it was a negotiation between families um, it wasn't wasn't it wasn't something that was visited upon couples by God, and it wasn't it wasn't something that that was sort of holy writ or or even social writ. W R I T. Um, it was it was a series of strategic alliances, and you would say it was a, a sort of a patriarchal institution to protect um, the male's inheritance uh, or the male's ability to um, pass pass his inheritance on to his son. And if you had a wife who you sort of in inverted commas captured um, in the home, and you captured her fidelity, her sexual fidelity, um, and you could be sure then that the child that was being produced from this union was yours it was one of the key the key reasons that 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 marriage became much more widespread and then became institutionalized what i'm not saying is that now marriage isn't 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 a romantic affair it obviously is now and there's 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 all sorts of horror, horror, uh, horror historical discourse about the notion of romantic love and the the notion of strategic love and that's uh, arranged marriages compared to our our western uh, conceptualization which i i'm arguing is is relatively recent and reasonably narrow in the, that we marriage, marry for love and sexual desire um, whereas in, in many other countries uh, and, and civilizations today these they aren't the major considerations in, in terms of marriage. Certainly it was going on between between a man and a woman but it wasn't it, it, it wasn't as as characterized. Um, so the the history of marriage has in 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 the West in particular in the European context has has been a strategic alliance tied up with property that maybe you could argue in the nineteenth and twentieth century evolved into into what we know it know it as today as a as a romantic union that that's that's based on 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 sexual fidelity, um, sexual desire, and sexual love, uh, which flows then into the production of, of of children, and and then into into this consumption unit. If you think back to uh, one of the earlier lectures when I was talking about um, how the family was consolidated as a consumption unit at the beginning of the um, the twentieth century in Australia in 1907 with a harvester judgment that, that that gave a salary to a man to support his wife and family um, in in frugal comfort um, that was that was part of a welfare state approach you, you'd have to say about looking after the the the, the essential unit of society which which what was the nuclear family? Um, it also, it also, as I was explaining in the terms of Fordism and mass production, aided in the consumption and the ability to consume um, uh, the 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 results of mass production. So, marriage marriage wasn't, and and to a certain extent, still, I mean, isn't 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 that that simple in terms of a, a romantic union that 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 has has come from time immemorial out of beyond the or into the mists of memory and and has always been this union that that has been um been been spiritual and romantic and only ever um couched in those terms so um marriage has been a much more much more plastic a much more manipulable um manipulative union than than that we've also now we've got the when we we we're looking at at the notion of of families um families have become much more fluid these days we have all sorts of configurations um of families weber um who who hasn't made an appearance for a little while now weber um 
back in the, the late 19th, early 20th century when he was theorizing was, was prepared to accept uh, a family was, were, was uh, a group of people who lived under the one roof, who shared a space and shared resources. Um, that was uh, the definition that, that Weber liked to think of in terms of family. And if you think of, of your, your particular circumstance, um, there are always people close people around the family who have access um, and I've always thought of, of, of family members in the broader context depending on, on, on um, your attitudes uh, are people who could walk into the house without knocking so and there are always people in our lives <coughs> excuse me always people in, in our lives who don't need to be invited in and in that context, you, you, you can probably think of them as, as members of, of your family. Certainly there's the notion of extended families that, that in, in the, sort of the Australian um, British context um, doesn't get expressed um, in terms of, of, of people living together to the same extent that it does in European cultures. But now we have blended families, we have step families, we have gay families, like I was saying. Um, we have couples who live together and then we have the, the increasing phenomenon of um, single households. Um, people who, who haven't partnered, people who, who have partnered and who've, who've lost their partner, um, and increasingly in Australia, we're going to we're going to have with the the way things are going for the baby boomers, um, large cohorts of people who are living by themselves. Um, and then the notion of family is is really quite challenging because if if we we usually in the say the 50s or the functionalist conceptualization of marriage, you had family which was the nuclear family and then you had the grandparents and you had the aunts and uncles with all their, their nuclear families and you had singles um, who were single for a, a short period of time um, and, and in that liminal state between moving from a family to another family but the transition from family to the next family was, was reasonably short and so we had, we had a country, a world of families um, we no longer have that, or we have the unusual situation now of, of adults living with adults, you know, adult children um, staying in the family and you have, um, there's one of, one of my um, PhD students or honor students who's, who's going to go on to a PhD is looking at the, um, the infantilization of, of male children in, uh, in particular um, linked to this, this phenomenon of, of, of people staying at home to a much older age than they ever have before in, in 30s and in some cases into their 40s. Uh, so the family form is, is, is shifting and changing to a much greater extent. Still we understand, I suppose notionally, the fundamental idea of a family as mum, dad and, and, and the kids, but, but it's not the case. There are, there, are, there are many different formulations of family. Um, and if we're not happy with the notion that, that uh, any, any grouping other than mum, dad and the kids is a family, we, we, we capture it in the idea of intimate relationships that, that, and, and we've sort of lifted up the level of intimate relationships to that level of, of family, family associations. Um, so that, that uh, in the functionalist sense, in the, the sort of the conservative Durkheimian sense, uh, we probably opened up to that as well, but, but um, they would have problems dealing with, with two people living together, whether they be heterosexual or, or homosexual doesn't particularly matter, um, but without the, the sanction of marriage or the sanction of the state and the sanction of the church, um, you've got this notion that you have intimate relationships and family relationships. I think these lines have, have blurred and that, that we understand and accept that families uh, are much more fluid than that and that a family dynamic can change. So you can have uh, partners come into a relationship where there are children um, and for a time form a family and then that family dissolves and, and come becomes 
something else. It becomes then a single parent family again and it may later embrace a, um, a, an additional partner that, that forms a family. And the, the problem also in, in, in relation to the families in the welfare state then is that there is still a reasonably draconian attitude um, uh, by the state in relation to what constitutes a family um, and there's this, this difficult negotiation between um, uh, for those who need, need support um, women are, women's romantic, emotional and sexual lives if they have children and are subject to, to support from, from the government um, their, their, their intimate life is regulated and, and subject to surveillance to, a, to an extent that none of us would suffer under normal circumstances. So if, if a man happens to be around a woman who's receiving benefits from the government, um, they have, <laughs> there's, there's, there are constituent amounts of days that uh, a man, or it, it may be the case that a man with his children, although statistically less likely, um, has a woman coming to say, there are a number of days that that you can you can stay over uh, before it's considered a relationship arbitrarily by by the state and and money is taken away because the assumption is that if you're having a sexual relationship with somebody you're also receiving money from them so it, there is this this crude notion of 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 prostitution that, that this is actually describing which is is obviously not true but the implication is that 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 um, um, you 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 must be forming a family if you're having a sexual relationship in the context of the welfare state. So there are there are these these interesting other components to to family that are mediated by the state that that we also have have to consider as as well. Um, the whole notion of children in the state and how much the state's prepared to provide to single parents. Um, and and their children and and the expectations on releasing um, um, parent from um, the benefit of of being supported while they bring up their children to to having to to go out and and support themselves to to a greater extent w with the children getting to younger and younger ages is also a, something that that's that's worth discussing and sharing maybe in the tutes if you you've had experience of that so the context of family is uh, from a sociological point of view um, benefits a lot from understanding family in the context of history. Understanding family in the context of capitalism I think is important because it's it's inevitable if you look at the historical development of marriage you'll see that that a lot of marriage uh, uh, has, has been um, established through strategic and for strategic means it's also been established for 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 uh, access to property and the exchange of property and it's only relatively recently that we've talked about love and 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 sexual desire and romance as as the key and that's that's then the difficult thing that that we face with with gay marriage uh, conceding that 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 um, that that challenge to our conceptualization um, is really only a minor challenge when you look at it over the con context of history. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the discussion with the um, the tutors this week, and I'll I'll see you next week. Bye bye. This has been a Swinburne production.